All right, we're back. My name is Brad Minus. I'm the host of Life Changing Challengers. And today I am so honored to have Rhonda Parker Taylor. She's an author, a researcher, also an entrepreneur. And she's got a really special story about overcoming adversity, learning disorders, and some other challenges that she came in through her life. So this is going to be an amazing episode, and I'm really looking forward to it. So Rhonda, how are you tonight? I am great. It would be better if it would really turn spring in Indiana, but we have the eclipse coming soon. So hopefully it all all will come out in the wash, but right now it's rainy. Oh man, I'm sorry to hear that. I I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, Mm -hmm. so I understand what you're going through. The changes are crazy and we're just about to head into winter. Well, actually, no, you're heading into spring. So right. everything's going to be much better. I know for sure. It'll get so, right now. You're dressing for all four seasons every day. Oh, wow. Is it, it's, it's that unpredictable, huh? Yes, it's very unpredictable. Oh, wow. So I always ask the same question of everybody. Mm-hmm. So could you tell us a little bit about your childhood, how you grew up to compliment your family and the environment that you grew up in? Sure. So I'm originally from Indiana, but I'm not from the Indianapolis area originally. I'm from a small town called Noblesville, which is in the northern part of the Indianapolis suburbs. It was a very small town when I grew up. It's grown since then. As a matter of fact, I think it's one of considered one of the best counties that you could live in the United States right now. But it was small, and then I also went to a private school. So. That school was only, there was only 50 in my graduating class. That's how small, but it had very high standards. And if you wanted to talk about my family, they were a very much traditional patriarch structure, loving, but you know, you, you definitely had to perform at your highest level. My dad's favorite saying was, if it's meant to be, it's up to me, which is basically would tell us that all the time. If you don't compare yourself. Don't, you know, don't put yourself in that win- windmill. If you want to do something, then you have to be the one to do it. Don't expect someone else to do it for you. But that was kind of challenging because I was the baby girl. There was five of us kids. I have a little brother. So I was, you know, the second to the youngest. I was kind of, people would say I was social. But at the same time, I was very timid. Things would frighten me make me scared easily. So I was, kind of, I, if I were to categorize myself as one of the dogs, you know, breeds, it's one of those ones that just hides behind their owners all the time. It was a difficult transition for me sometimes. I was, I flunked kindergarten. How do you flunk kindergarten? That's what I was going to ask. That's, they told me that's I was, terrible, <laughs> actually. I, I just wasn't going to be ready. That's what they said. So For me, socializing became my lifeline. Mm, And my older brother, I considered him the smart one. So I didn't ever want to compete. So I just kept navigating towards social and supporting my friends and my family. And so for me personally, I didn't do the self-development that I probably needed to at a younger age. And so, you know, instead of worrying about what I needed to learn and my challenges and expressing some of the challenges that I had, I would navigate helping others and making Uh, sure they were being successful. I would say that I probably had a learning disability. If I had to guess, you know, I've done a lot of studying in my adult years, I would say I probably have some ADHD, not diagnosed with it, but just from knowing how I pop around. And my dad used to describe me as a butterfly. He said, you're like a a butterfly. All you do is go from flower to flower. Right. (laughs) So I think for me, the challenges also became what I used to motivate me too, because I got humiliated in some cases Hmm. when I was not being successful like some maybe some of my peers or some of my family members so a good example is we had to pass an English proficiency test and to graduate 
and I flunked in my junior year and you had to pass it with a C or better. So one of the teachers, the English teacher, her name was Ms. Donnelly. She said, you know, I'll tutor you over the summer. So I had gone out and gotten a, a job at Arby's and I w- was sitting on her floor, you know, in, in the afternoons and working at night and it, the summer was over. My senior year was coming and she had really gotten to know me. So this is where the power of a mentor really can make a difference because she changed the whole trajectory of my life. Really? Yes, because that I, I passed and I went to to pay her. I asked her how much I owed her. and She said, you just pass. Pay it forward. Yeah. And so, yeah. so she, you know, she was probably only 98 pounds, just a little spitfire of a woman. And I found that I could be successful and I could be that business person that I thought I wanted to be. And in my mind, I always thought I had to shift and go in a direction that would require the math, the writing, the English okay. and stuff like that. So I went, so I got to go to college because of that. That's amazing. And so then, yes, it was more like a junior college at first and it was in fashion. So I went to learn to be a buyer and I'm thinking I can do fashion. I, you know, that, that was, you know, the thing for women. And I went to D- the Dallas area, Fort Worth, cause all the rich and single people were supposed to live in Dallas. So right. all, all, all people like me remember the Dallas and the dynasty shows. And so I went, Oh down- yeah. Right. Right. JR. Who shot JR? <laughs> I don't remember. So I went down there and I learned that not only could I, be successful, but I learned how to change the way I approached learning. I'd always tried to do it through memorization and I always tried to do it through, you know, the techniques of a person that needs to hear it or see it. And I didn't realize I needed both and I needed to be able to do it with my hands, you know, and really engross myself in it. So here I am you know, as a grown person with a doctorate. That's so amazing. All, all the way through that, just because one person spent the time with me, but I had to be prepared. And that's the thing that a lot of times that people don't realize you don't get opportunities unless you're prepared. It's not luck. It's opportunity and preparation meeting. That's what luck really is. And what did your dad always say? If it's meant to be, it's up to me. <laughs> there you go. That's it. You lived it. You absolutely yeah. lived it. I do want to ask a couple of things because I know that earlier in life, I don't know if it was high school or prior to that, that you had been gravitated. You had gravitated toward writing even then, but you found it difficult. Can you tell me how you felt or what that actually looked like? Just in case that we've got somebody that's watching or listening, I should say, that might have some of those symptoms that, you know, to give them some hope and right. show them that, hey, there's a way to move past this. Oh, definitely. So the first thing is when I was taking a writing class, well, when I was younger, I was always carrying a book. I didn't realize it, but they were all way over my head, probably intellectually, but it sh- showed that I had a desire to learn about the world. Here again, I came from a small town. Encyclopedias, karma, you know, all these things that, you know, that are really deep rooted. So that's the first sign that, wait a minute, where is this coming from? But for me, I had to write and they said, what's your first memory? And it took that first memory and it was in the writing 101 class. Here again, I couldn't write. And once I pulled that one thread out and saw the challenge that I had, it was the destruction of my pink blanket. That was my first memory. Oh, wow. Okay. Like when you were a little kid, when you're carrying a little pink blanket around and it was when my brothers and sisters decided it was time for it to go. They had to take your binky away. Yes, they did. So (laughs) what it did though, is when I sat down to write, I realized that not only could it be about your emotions and feelings, but there was a whole world that you can build out there. So I wrote about the memory, but then I also made it into 
a learning lesson huh. about growth and self-development because, you know, I was in a writing class and I found then that I really enjoyed pulling out that emotion. And I think that if anybody ever reads, whether it be any of my academic writing or my fiction novel, Crossroads, you'll, you'll find that I spend a lot of detail more on the people and what their emotions, like um, Crossroads explores the emotions of anger, fury, and envy. Right. And so... I spend that time navigating the individual and trying to create a bond between the reader and the characters. But it's really also with me because we've all experienced all of that. No matter what your life is, whether it be full of blessings or full of challenges and challenges or a little mixed of both, we've all gone through some of those emotions at some point so the part about writing is it really assists one whether it be for journaling for fiction for you know work whatever it is if you put yourself into it and you create something that you can be proud of then you've successfully completed that day and that great day is great oh absolutely and just for your information everybody crossroads is a it's a suspense novel that she wrote and you actually wrote it in 2000 but actually didn't publish it till 2023 oh there it is but here it is it's crossroads and i do want to say that i'm really into the imagery part of things so indiana is considered the crossroads of america it's because of the railroad tracks originally the railroad tracks were here and well there's still railroad tracks but everything went through indiana it had to get to any part of the United States. And Crossroads is about navigating the world. And I wrote it in 2000. And the blessing of it was it took me, I was able to sit down and just write it. And it took me about a year to get it all ready. I had a publisher ready. And then my life started coming in un unraveled. Mm -hmm. I was, I was working in academics, I was also part of, I had just gotten promoted to be a campus director for a local college. And then. Hold I, on a second. We need to step back here. Just one quick second. Did you hear this? Did you actually hear this? This woman was talking about, she had to have a mentor to learn to write. Now she's a campus director. Can we sit there and say what a complete 360 that this woman did she went from borderline learning disorder to an academic that's absolutely that's amazing how you were able to pull that out and you did it with belief and that, that you, you could do it and a lot of hard work obviously and that you're that person and i'm really glad you stopped and made me take a step back because i think that anybody out there in your audience that's going through a challenge. I have a little jingle that I have for you. And it comes from Frosty the Snowman and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And it's put one foot in front of the other. Right. And still be walking across the floor. Any challenge that's out there. Yes, you're going to have to take a second to gather your thoughts. Um, practice the positivity to keep yourself from going over the edge. But then once you start putting those feet and, and putting a plan in place and staying disciplined and believing in yourself and stay in focus, it can happen. But you have to realize the true challenges of making it happen. And for me, you know, I thought it, it was going to be that first time when I had the publisher. Yeah. Then the world fell apart literally in my hands. I am sitting in my family room. I'm writing a letter, believe it or not. I'm writing a letter to somebody and there's a knock at the door. And that knock, what, when I opened it was my adopted son's girlfriend and a police officer. Oh. And they had, they came to tell me that my adopted son had been shot and killed at work and that literally that's the age group too he was working at a bar as a bouncer and they put somebody out and 
at when they came out at the last call, they shot the, the guy shot this whole security team. And Jeez. in that moment, nothing else mattered, of course. Right. That book sat on my on my desk after that for the longest. I always had all the intentions of the world to, you know, get it published and but I hadn't found the lesson yet in it. I was still reinventing myself because that challenge took me to a place that I'm like, can I really work with college students at that age, the same age as my son? And I knew that I could under certain circumstances, but being on a college campus was going to be too difficult. So I stepped back. From that, and I created my own business, which was mentoring students that had challenges. Oh, when, well, perfect. Whether it would be they didn't know how to do a resume, they didn't know how to do the career search with the computers. And, you know, a lot of people were trying to learn during that period of, about how to even do a job search with a computer because it used to be you do just the resume. Now it's this whole new computer age and nobody knew how to do it. And then also then eventually I pulled back the, the academics back into it and started mentoring for the people's um, masters and theses and dissertations. But I had to take the life lesson before I could take those, all those steps. And then one day I had to go in and I had to get something off a floppy disk. <laughs> floppy and it disk, was right? Corrupted, it was corrupted and it had my book on it. <gasps> and I looked at it sitting because I had printed it at one point because I was getting ready to publish it. Right. And it was, I looked at it sitting on my desk. It was still sitting in the same place it had been sitting. And I had images of me having to retype and edit the whole thing. Oh, my God. What we found in the lessons from losing a loved one and then looking like I was going to lose my the book was that I had some skills that I needed to work on still. Life being a life learner is one of the most important things you can do for yourself. And I was talking to my sister and she says, why haven't you published it? Okay. And I was like, well, you know, I'm busy and this and, you know, making every excuse. She says, that's not it. She says, you're afraid to be make yourself vulnerable. Mm. And I'm like, no, that's not it. I, of course I don't care if, you know, people, she says, you know, I don't care what people think. And sure enough, she was right. It mm. required me to reevaluate my priorities. And I found that in this, that season, in that moment, I had to take it a step back again and redefine, you know, what the lesson was supposed to be for me too in the book. I wrote the book as a reason to elevate myself and my skills. And I started hiding behind making others successful. I see. So when your sister had said, okay, is it, you need to make yourself vulnerable or is this is going to make you vulnerable? Is it, was it strictly about the writing? Is it, was your, that it was your art that you'd, you'd never put anything out there before that you needed to get that done or was there a piece of Paris Pennington in you that you didn't want the world to see within this masterpiece of fiction? I think it's both. I think that I didn't, I fearful of putting it out there, mm -hmm. but also I think, yes, there is a part of every character in there. That's me. You could say okay. it's Pennington, but you know, I'm a people person. So even Billy Knuckles, who's the, you know, the guy that yeah. has to debate whether he wants to be a rat against his friend or not, you know, I've never been in that situation, but guess what? I could have been because I was always putting people first, always putting, you know, excuses for behaviors. You know, I was always the more 
responsible one in the group, you know, so it very easily could have been me. How many times have we had someone that's gotten into our car and we really don't know what they're all about? Right. And so, so, you know, I think that it was, but Paris Pennington, definitely people would always say that I always had it together. You know, even though in most people that, you know, my story and know, known me since pre-kindergarten would say, I didn't know you had a, you know, a learning challenge or disability. They thought, you know, they were like, oh, you were, you know, you were popular. You had this. And it's like, they didn't know, you know, right. so undertaking the challenge, a challenge of exposing that, hey, everybody's house has, is made of glass and can be easily shattered. And mine had been shattered many times. You know, whether it be, you know, the death of, I've, I've had several loved ones. We have a, I have a date that, you know, I dread every year because I'm like, okay, who am I going to lose this year? Because everybody that I've known and loved has died on September 19th. What? I'm sorry. That just threw me for a loop. It, but it's the truth. And it, so it's like, that's a whole nother book that I could write. You know, Probably. So, because my mother died on it. Four years later, my son died on it. Then my dad turned around and, and his was going to be, he, they were telling us that he wasn't going to make it. And, you know, the, it was a September 19th and, and they, he, we told him, well, you know, he's the same day as mom. And she's, he said, no, let him, let her have her day and do it after midnight. And so uh -huh. he died on September 20th. And then I have had an uncle and then, you know, it's like everybody, it's yeah. like everybody. And I think that what I can hopefully tell people is to face those fears. Crossroads was a fear for me. You're right. Paris Pennington is a part of me, but it isn't me, but it is. We all navigate the world with a set of core values. My set of core values from my, that was handed down from my, my, my father and my family is you must work. If you don't work, you're, you don't have value. Right. You know? And that's a big Midwest yeah. you know, core value. And so that was Paris's core value. So yeah, yes, there's a lot of Paris that's in it, but I, I had to realize that the commitment had to be to me also. I would run around for 20 years pushing people to be the best versions of themselves. But I had stopped doing the self-care, and I'm not talking about just, you know, fitness self-care. I'm talking about the self-care of emotions, self-care mm -hmm. of relationships, self-care of mindfulness, self-awareness, because I was doing it for other people. I was just pushing them forward and pushing them forward. And I don't regret that. Trust me, I, you know, I have gotten so much joy out of seeing people break through their own barriers, but it was just time for me to give myself that same chance. Yeah, there is a book, and you probably know about it because just just you just because of your academia. But it's called "The Artist's Way" by Julia Cameron. Mm -hmm. You heard of it? Yes. So she actually defines that person because I used to be that person too. Actually, I still am to a point, but. I have come to a point where I've learned that I've got to take care of myself first and then move forward. But that took me a while as well. But she decides she defines it as the shadow warrior mm. is the person that's always pushing other people to get to their best. Right. And they're the ones in the back. They're the shadow. But that shadow never sees the light. Right. So that's what you were saying is a classic definition of what Julia said was the shadow warrior. That's that doesn't say that there's anything bad about the shadow warrior. The shadow warrior is a very most likely a very good person, but they don't do the things for themselves. They don't seek out the success for themselves. They only see it for other people, which is what you did, which is what I did in the same way. So, yeah, I can see that happening. I do have a quick question for you. Sure. Was there any bit of that exposure of vulnerability that you wrote into Crossroads when the judge kind of outs Paris Pennington? Was there, yes, because I think that everybody's been in a position 
whether it be a loved one, whether it be the court system, or whether it be, you know, even yourself, mm-hmm. where you've put yourself in a situation and then you're out, as you would put it. But also during the period of time when I was just before I wrote Crossroads, I had been part of a crime watch district. And it wasn't where I lived. It was where my church was located in the Indianapolis area. And they gave me a adopt a block area that was six blocks of about the worst of Indianapolis. Ooh. And I learned a lot about the justice system. And even though the United States has one of the best justice systems in the world, It's not perfect. Not even close. Right. And there is no winners and losers. There's everybody's a loser when you end up in the justice system, including the jury foreman, because you're a vulnerable place and you're, and you learn a lot by just being in the room because Mm. it doesn't matter whether you're a victim a prosecutor, a defense attorney, a judge, a jury, the family of the victim, the family of the perpetrator, all of them are in the room and now they have to be there for a period of time together. And now you have to decide, okay, what am I supposed to learn? And that's what Paris went through. And I went through that many a times. I can remember this elderly lady that lived in those six blocks and she would call my cell phone. That was just, you know, around the time cell phones were really, you know, hot and and she would call it and want me to call the police for. Oh. Because she said they wouldn't come if it was from her house phone because of the, of the, the digits they would know. So I would call and they would be there in minutes. Mm. And I realized that when I wrote Crossroads, I wanted to portray the imperfectness, but at the same time, the camaraderie of going through that process. And I thought that's what the whole book was going to be about. Right. When I first started the, the journey, but then I realized that the, the characters kind of took over. And they and their personalities kind of took over. And I'm like, oh, this is a little bit more than that. It's not just about the injustices. It's also about the people and what they're capable of and what they're not capable of. And obviously the three emotions that I had said earlier, which is anger is cruel. Fury is overwhelming. But who can stand before just before envy or jealousy? Envy makes the bones rot. Oof, that's strong. And I realized that's a navigation that this that the world needs to hear to even today. Because how many times in social media do we try to compare ourselves? It goes back to some of the things that my father used to say that used to drive me crazy. It's being the youngest. Don't compare yourself to your older sister. Well, yeah, that's a little different. But today we're comparing. Our houses, our cars, our fitness, our jobs, our children, our, you know, what they ate for dinner, you know, cook the best. And so what's wrong with just being who you are? I get that. And I totally see what you're coming from, especially with the propaganda that seems to be being put out today. And it's causing those three emotions that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And people aren't in my opinion, people aren't thinking right. Mm -hmm. You know, when facts are placed in front of you and it's right there in front of you and all the evidence shows a black and white situation and all of a sudden everybody else is seeing gray. Somebody's putting one thing that becomes viral and that piece of information, whether it's right or completely wrong and takes over. It causes that fury and that anger and that's all they see. All they see is the red. You know, it's just in front of them and they don't want to move forward and and they don't want to see the facts. Right. And you get disgruntled with your own life. Right. You know, and instead of just enjoying, hey, have you looked out the window, your window of your house or your apartment? Have you gone for a walk? Have you enjoyed a puppy lately? Have You know, whatever it might be that brings you joy. 
you know, finding that life balance is very important not to your mental health, your spiritual health, your physical health, your body remembers everything. And trust me, you, I am the billboard of stuff happens. Mm. And if you don't learn to navigate that and be prepared, you know, then when it does happen, life is going to hit, you know, it could be today, tomorrow, a year from now, but it's going to hit again. So you should enjoy every moment the best you can. And it might mean that you had to work all day, but then enjoy the work that you're doing. It might mean that you had to eat a hot dog rather than a steak, you know, whatever it might be, you know, enjoy it. You know, it might be that you saw a, a raccoon go through your yard and I'm a big nature lover. So, you know, yeah. that brings me the most joy. But if we can give our your, give ourselves a break and practice resilience, th- then we don't have to worry about all, the, all those emotions because we'll tailor it down. Emotional intelligence is very important for everybody. I agree with that wholeheartedly. So let's move forward. So let's go back to the story. Let's get back into Rhonda Parker Taylor's story. So your sister says, why haven't you published it? Mm -hmm. Is that the turning point where you decide, okay, it's time to get this thing going. You said that the the floppy disk was corrupted, but you had a a paper copy. Right. What what happened after that? There's four, there were four, there's four books on that floppy disk. So we were able to retrieve all but one. But it took me a while. I had to find, you know, the right tech guru. And I had to really put myself in a a position where I had to realize how important it was to me. It was one of those things that meant more to me than I'd ever thought it did. And I could remember going to conferences and them saying some of the best novels are in somebody's closet. And I thought. I don't want them to be cleaning out my house and find this book in the closet. You know, it's, you know, you know, when I'm 80 years old or whatever year it is. So I, I started looking then and I wasn't really sure which direction. Cause if you go the traditional route, it takes a long time. It took a, a year after that date to get someone that I could partner with. I ended up going with a blended matrix publisher, which means they help you with the publishing. They do that, but they also will help you with the marketing. And then you have a set budget that you guys both agree on and it's a contract. And so it's kind of both self-publishing and traditional publishing. publishing they right. are their own publisher and they know what they're doing. And I thought that was going to be the, the glory part of it. I was going to get it on. I kept telling everybody, I'll just be happy to see it in, in print. Right. And we're in the middle of the editing process and they're like, you know, we really think that you need to send this book to somebody and ha- have them write the forward. And I'm like, well, you know, I'll, I'll be glad to get someone to do write the forward, you know, and they're like, no, that's not good enough. And then I'm like, well, what are you talking about? They said, well, let's, you know, who do you, who do you think would best represent it? And I'm like, well, it's suspense. So maybe like a Tory spelling, if I was going to hit the sky for it. And they're like, no, she, you know, that's not the right person. We think you need to send it, send a letter and we'll deliver it to her and to her people to um, Merrill Hemingway. And yes. for people that are out there that are a little younger than us and don't know who Merrill Hemingway is, she's the um, granddaughter of Ernest Hemingway, the great author. And she also is an actress and writer also. Um, she was Golden Globe and I think Academy Awards also. Um, She's nominated for Academy Award. That's correct. Yeah, yeah I was a big fan of Muriel Hemingway growing up. Yeah. Beautiful woman. Beautiful. Yes. Mama. Why would she care? You know, it, I'm from Noblesville. I'm a small town girl. There's where that whole hold yourself back a little bit and not have the networking that I need. Anybody else, I would have been pushing them out there. And they said, just write the letter. So it took me the weekend to write a letter. And I'm like, well, you, we haven't gotten through the, you know, the final edits. And they said, no, she wants to see it in the raw. Nice. And I'm like, okay, here we go. So I got it together and I, and the letter and, you know, introduced myself and it took about a couple of weeks and they brought it back. I that she wanted to write the forward and she wrote a, she also did a YouTube video that's out there. I think it's called Rhonda 
All right, Merrill Hemingway praises Rhonda Parker Taylor's Crossroads. And I'll tell you, anybody that's out there that has a dream, actualize it. Picture it, do it. Practice your self-care and provide yourself purpose and be realistic because it's not always the pie in the sky. But when I heard that video and her explaining why that she was putting it part of her book club. And that was that everybody in life comes to a crossroads at some point in their life. And she explained that she had to with her family having mental health issues and everybody in crossroads has something. She said, then there comes to a point in your life that you, when you hit that crossroads, that you have to realize that even chocolate has an expiration date. And I was like, Oh my goodness. You know, she got it. She got the point that sometimes you have to navigate and change so that things don't happen to you. Crossroads is like a game of clues, Agatha Christie clue game where I try to provide just little tidbits about why people have different kinds of motivation. And she got it. And it was, it, even though, things were happening to Paris and people were dying and getting sick and everything really it all could have been avoided. Mm -hmm. It all could have been avoided had she navigated her world with purpose and her own purpose, not everybody else's purpose. So yes, we have the crime thriller and the judge and this, but really deep down had she been more aware of her life she could have avoided a lot of it. Yeah, it is an amazing book and really written well. I mean, it takes you from the first chapter. You do a very an amazing job at background and you get to the background. I felt it pretty quick. Now there's a couple of reviews that you got that th people thought that it was you kind of it was a little bit slower getting to that point. I don't think so. I think you hit the nail on the head with the amount of background, especially when you started out with Detective Brown and, and then Paris and then going into the office and then her, you know, and her need to satisfy her boss and and the whole thing. And I thought that was the background was fantastic. And then you get into the trial and it's yeah, and it just rocks and rolls from there, right? Right. So, yeah. So you're absolutely right. Meryl Hemingway praises Rhonda Parker Taylor's new release, Crossroads. And you really need to read this book because it is, yeah, it is something else. I got to tell you. And, and I usually would like end and I'd ask you for some steps that you should take, but you just rattled them off. Basically the steps that, hey, if you want to do something, visualize it and don't let things stand in your way. And especially don't let your need to help others stand in your way. Did I get that right? That is exactly right. And you know, I am, I have a workbook coming out. It'll probably be self-published because it takes life balance and it helps people that has that same problem. I mean, you say you, you did the same thing you put yeah, in. I did. No, you, or, you know, you, one of the things I found that I was doing, and I, I did this with my classes a lot of times, I would do this these exercises, but I would say, okay, well, I'm perfectly balanced. I do 30% this, 30% this, but I, the joy wasn't a part of it. So then I sat down and did my own exercises, and it's like, oh, well, I'm watching 10 hours of television, and it's 50th on my list of things that I enjoy doing. You know, so it kind of helps navigate. And I use the crossroads and I have the case studies of the different characters in it. Mm. So that people can try to relate that you, you're not alone in this. This is a daily struggle for most people to have balance and to bring joy in their lives and to put themselves first. And those that aren't putting themselves first, they're not balanced typically either because they're too far the other directions. So I'm hoping that as I continue to write, because I plan to, that I can take these life lessons that we do and put them in the characters to make them real. 
incorporate the things that you've learned yeah, and then help those characters develop that way. That's actually pretty brilliant, Rhonda. That's well, pretty brilliant. Yeah. To be able to take, um, so, cause I love books like this. This is something that I read all the time. I read Black Banner mm -hmm. and Luke Wilson and these guys that have these like really delicate, you know, thrillers out there and I love them. So this was like right up my alley. And, but the way to incorporate, I don't want to call it, we'll call it self-development yeah. into the characters. That's brilliant because not only does it become a recreational activity, but it becomes a self-development activity. So you're getting two things in one. Like you were mentioning a list, you know, your TV was the 50th, but if three or four is reading crime novels mm -hmm. and five and six are, and three and four is self-development, there you go. You get to fit it right in. You get to, you get two for the price of one. That's pretty brilliant. I love that idea. Yeah. And I think that we all can learn from fiction. You know, I talked about the workbook, but the second book, I take the girl that's at the end that got in the car with the wrong people and got herself yeah. in trouble. I take her and I, I take an approach, a totally different approach to how she gets involved in things. And it's not only her, na her being naive, but her inability to tell right from, you know, good from bad. And right. It's really just that openness that can get you in trouble too. So I, and many a times we develop people to be victims. I get it. Give me one yeah. second. I don't know. Okay. All right. So you got the workbook coming up and then you, and then what you were saying about the book with the character from the end. Right. And it's, the working title right now is called Chosen. Okay. And it's basically, it navigates how people sometimes that aren't aware, especially young people, can get themselves in situations where they're victimized. That's something that's, that, that needs to be put out there right now. Because, yeah. I mean, the funny thing is with social media and everything right now, I feel like some of high schoolers, get victimized and don't even realize it until it's too late. Right. I coach high school cross country and track and field and I see what's going on. You know what I mean? They talk about it and it's kind of in the background and these perfectly cheerful and kids that are brought up in great homes get caught up in this mess and it's, it's tragic. And, you know, I watched some team members, you know, have like weighted GPAs of like 4.15 and 4.0 and then turn out and have, you know, 3.3, 3.4 the next month, be, not the next year because of something that happened. And I, so that is a book that's going to be definitely important to be looking out for, but yeah, that's, but that's amazing. So I'm tech, I, I am extremely excited to hear about that one when you come up and, and publish that one. So, so for everybody out there, Rhonda Parker Taylor, dot com is where you can find everything including that incredible youtube video with muriel hemingway talking about crossroads you can find the links to crossroads for amazon and barnes and noble on her site but i'm also going to put it in the show notes so they can directly go right to that right right to that and find it on amazon.com find it on barnesandnoble.com i'm going to make sure that the link's right there but you guys got to read this book and then of course she's got some other books coming up that we're going to be looking for so Rhonda, listen thank you thank you so much i i can't imagine you are an inspiration to all of us that had struggles you know in school i don't i wouldn't have a learning disability i was just lazy but but you know i felt like i did uh, and i got over it in a different way it was more of a like a pounding on the head but you're an inspiration to where you know where you couldn't write and then all of a sudden now you're a professor at at a college and then you know getting your own business and i just think it's amazing and what you've done and you're and what you've taught us today about taking time for yourself having a balance and to go after your dream, visualize it, go after it. That's right. Because if it's meant to be, it's up to me. There you go. That's <laughs> perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda, for spending this time with us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And everybody out there.
Be blessed and have a great day. Thank you. We'll see you in the next one, everyone.